Welcome to Think Theism Podcast, and we have with us today Dr. Mike Lacona, who's the foremost scholar on the resurrection. Mike, welcome to A&M Ratio Christi. Oh, thanks, Julie. I should say, I, howdy. <laughs> well, howdy. Yep. I would say, I don't think I'm the foremost. Uh, Gary Habermas, I'd give that title too, but... Um, Y'all may be sharing it a little bit now. <laughs> So first of all, I would like for you to share kind of the current state of res resurrection research. More, that's kind of a broad question, but more specifically, since you and Gary have been um, using the minimal facts methodology for a long time now, um, has it changed or developed up to now? So first, just resurrection research and then about the minimal facts approach. Yeah. Well, um, you know, there have been some major publications on it in the last you know 20 years you had uh nt wright came out with his big book the resurrection of the son of god um in uh, 2003 um great book he really didn't um his biggest contribution in it however was the work that he did on the beliefs of the afterlife in antiquity jewish beliefs and pagan beliefs um, that was his ma the major contribution of that book, I think. Um, and then you had a couple years later, two years later, Dale Allison came out with a book called Resurrecting Jesus. It had a number of his stuff that he'd written. It wasn't all about resurrection. Only about half of it was on resurrection. And Dale Allison, um, he teaches at Princeton now. He was at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary at the time. He's a top-notch New Testament mm -hmm. scholar. Um, and And... You know, he raised some, he's not a, a conservative by any means, um, but um, he concluded at the end he thought Jesus rose from the dead. Um, it was an interesting, very interesting read. He raised some different kind of objections. He's well read, um, broadly read, you know, all the way from internet skeptics, all the way up to fundamentalist Christians who mm -hmm. may, some of them not even scholars, but he knows what they're saying on things. Um, a few years later, 2010, I came out with my large book, uh, The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach. And I think I was the first one to do a lot um, based on the philosophy of history. You know, but, uh, and that was largely influenced by well, what are philosophers of history and general historians, those who practice history outside the community of, of biblical scholars. How do they conduct their craft? How do they uh, conduct a historical investigation? So, you know, I talked about the uh, postmodernist challenge, and you have postmodernists, and, and then you have realist historians, cri critical realists, and how do we get to know the past? What is it actually that historians are attempting to do? And how do we, how do we know, get to know the past? What, what kind of methods do we use? And then how does the presence of it being a miracle claim. How does that impact a historian's investigation? So those alone, I broke some new ground on, on things with that, and then I applied that to the resurrection of Jesus. So then after that, you've got, um, oh, I would guess within the last uh, two years, I think two years ago, Andrew Woke, Loke, An An Woke, <laughs> Andrew Loke. Loke. Um, Loke, L-O-K-E, woke, I'm thinking, that's crazy, but Andrew Loke came out with a big book on the resurrection. I um, don't know that one. I haven't read it, but I, I've heard all good things about it, and, and Loke is a, is a really good scholar. So um, that, and then last year... And he's a theologian or a historian? Um, well, he's done some stuff on, on Christology, too. I think that was his his doctoral work mm -hmm. on Christology. So I think it's, he probably does theology, but I mean, he's done historical stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. That plus this, this, this book on the resurrection. And then last year, Dale Allison came out with another book on the resurrection, this only about resurrection. It's quite large, it's a little larger than mine. Um, so I don't think it has, it, it doesn't have the same as many page, uh, pages as mine has. But the font's smaller, and it, you know the, it's a little more difficult to read because of that. But it's an outstanding book; it really is. And so that's a lot of big 
scholarship done yeah. in the last. Yeah, and then of course you got Gary Habermas who's working on his magnum opus, which is going to be 5,500 pages uh -huh. or more. And that will be the uh, reference to have on the resurrection. I don't know if anybody's going to, I'm sure some people will read through the whole thing, but that would be kind of like more of the encyclopedia right, kind of right. thing. But okay. yeah, it's going to be great. Where is he on that? You know, he's about finished, I think. It's just a matter now of going back and editing, uh -huh. and that just takes a long time. So it's well, going to be, you So know. getting about the minimal facts, have, oh. have, since you started and he started ta uh, using the minimal facts as, def as a defense of the resurrection, has that developed or changed? You're, I mean, you're using the same facts you always did, or do, do the mm. facts sometimes change because you have different consensus saying that, that these are the accepted facts that you argue from? Yeah, I mean, good question. So, so two things here. Number one, his way of doing minimal facts has changed over time. So mm -hmm. when he did this for his doctoral dissertation back in the 70s, it was kind of like, okay, here are 12 facts that are granted by most, the majority of scholars mm -hmm. who study and have written on this subject. Mm -hmm. Here's 12 facts. Mm -hmm. Minimal facts was like, hey, you know what? We can take just a handful, like three or four, any three or four of these, just choose from them, any three or four, and just based on this minimal number of facts from these 12, mm -hmm. we can still build a pretty good case for the resurrection. Mm -hmm. That was minimal facts 1.0. Mm -hmm. Minimal facts 2.0 is kind of like what he's using now, and that is like, um, let's just focus on facts, a minimal number of facts that are so strongly supported by the data that it has compelled a very strong uh, consensus of scholars or majority of scholars to embrace them as facts. Mm -hmm. So To argue from. Exactly. So my question. It's a little bit different. <clears throat> yeah. So on the 2.0, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I, I, I find that, that you're really trying to say that you get the most bang for your buck, mm -hmm. you know, these are so well attested that hardly anyone is going to take them down. Um, do you prefer still that that kind of um, that kind of minimal facts approach? But there's there's another maximalist approach. Mm -hmm. Is it superior to in some way to this minimal um, facts approach, or what what what's your opinion? Yeah, I think it, I think it's got its strengths and weaknesses. So, um, you know, if you go with the maximalist approach, then you're going to bring in a lot of other things like the Gospels and, and a lot of other sources. Um, and, yeah, if you... Here's the thing. In, in history, some things are better attested than others, right? Right. Um, so when you go away from the minimal facts, the reason other facts aren't in there is because they're not as strongly evidenced. So... Um, a maximalist approach might say, hey, you've got the, the resurrection attested in, in John's gospel, and that's written by John, the son of Zebedee, who is an eyewitness, right? But a lot of scholars won't give it to you that John, the son of Zebedee, wrote it. In fact, the majority of critical New Testament scholars today reject the traditional authorship of John's gospel. Right. So, yeah, you could turn around and say, yeah, but I think there's good evidence for it. Okay, and, and I think there's some, some decent evidence that John, the son of Zebedee, wrote it. But there's better evidence for the traditional authorship of Mark and the traditional authorship of Luke than there is for the traditional authorship of John. So, yeah, you can uh, argue that, and maybe you're going to find your case, your maximalist case, stronger. But the skeptic is not. And as soon as you bring in something like John to a skeptic or a Muslim who, you know, they're, they're going to say, well, John didn't write that. And the more of these things that you bring in, they say, yeah, but the majority of scholars don't agree it with you on this. You've weakened your case. Yeah. yeah you've weakened your <laughs> yeah. case, in, at least in their eyes. Yeah. So the minimal facts approach, it's like almost everyone agrees on the facts. It's what you do with those facts. Now you narrow the discussion to what's the best explanation of those facts. Right. It's still an inference and it's still, but you're dealing with facts that people can't ignore. That's right. Right. Um, which of the minimal facts do you think is the strongest? Oh, boy. 
Well, they're all strong. That's they're why they're all, part they're of the minimal all facts. Strong. Well, so, I, I don't know if they're equally well, strong, but they're very strong. I, I call them historical bedrock. Um, um, and, and the reason I got that term. List, the one, list, list them because we haven't done that yet. Okay. So, so well, the, your previous question was, do they differ some? And uh -huh. yeah, like I, I'll use fewer. Gary Habermas uses a little bit, a few more than uh -huh. I do. I know. But I would say Jesus' death by crucifixion, that's accepted by 99.99% of all scholars that are talking about it. Um, that shortly after Jesus' death, a number of his disciples had experiences they interpreted as being appearances of the risen Jesus to them, okay? High 90s will grant you that. Um, they may differ on whether you can establish all of them did. You know, some will say, well, we're just not sure. We know it. we're sure of a few of them. Most will say, yeah, all, all of them, you know, had some sort of experience that they mm -hmm. interpret. Um, and then that you'll have somewhere between 75 to 85 percent will grant that some of these experiences occurred in group settings, that groups of people simultaneously had experiences of the risen Jesus, okay? They, they thought they saw the same thing. Um, and then you've got the, the appearance to Paul, at least that Paul had an experience. He was a, an enemy of Christianity. He has an experience that he interprets as an appearance of the risen Jesus, and it he, cha he converts to Christianity, about 100% virtually, 99.99% mm -hmm. grant that. Um, yeah, and then you could uh, throw in uh, James. I don't usually use James, the, the half-brother of Jesus. Gary does. No, I think he's justified in doing that. Um, we found that uh, roughly around 90% of critics who uh, you know, discuss it grant that James was a skeptic and that he had an appearance uh, some kind of an experience that he interpreted as a risen. Mm -hmm. I don't use it, and the reason being my criteria are a little bit stricter than Gary's. Um, 90% is fine, but the problem is I only found, I think, um, uh, 29 scholars, critical scholars who comment on it. So it's like there's not too many. They say, well, 29, it's still, well, it is, you know but not compared to the others. Mm -hmm. Those who talk about an empty tomb or talk about the appearance to Paul, you know, now you're talking well over 100. It's only 29, you know, and you may have three or so four So the empty tomb is one. Empty tomb, Gary, uh, well, Gary and I in our book, the, the Case for the Resurrection of Jesus, we include it, but we call it four plus one, uh -huh, and yeah. the empty tomb is the plus one, because it's not quite where the others. It's uh, Back in 2004, when that book was published, it was about 75%, Gary said. But his bibliography only had about 20, I think it was 2,200 or 2,400 sources. Now he's up to, I think, over 5,000 sources. Um, and um, it went down for well, a while. Well, that's what I mean. It can develop based on the scholarship, what, mm -hmm. they're, what they're taught, what they're granting, in other words, the broad scholarship in the resurrection. That's right. What they're granting, it can, it can develop and make you more using certain facts where maybe you wouldn't. Or, yeah. Right? Yeah. As you look at the that uh, Another data. reason I didn't include the empty tomb, and, and here's why. He does, and, and I don't do it in mine, because... I required not only a very strong majority of 90% or more, but it had to be a heterogeneous, strongly heterogeneous. For the empty tomb, you do have some non-believers who grant it, okay? Mm -hmm. You do have a few, but by far, most of those who scholars who grant the empty tomb are, are, are Christian Christians. scholars. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I wanted a strongly yeah. heterogeneous yeah. because if you have a strong heterogeneous consensus, who granted, then you know the data behind it must be really strong because a skeptic is going to have a bias against it and yet they're still willing to grant it. Right. Um, for fun, what's the strangest piece of evidence you've ever come across that demonstrates the resurrection? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, strangest? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. The shroud? No. I well, you could call yeah, that. Yeah. yeah that's so, kind of and if Gary Habermas, he would I say. like, I like what he says. He says, if the shroud is authentic, and he believes that it is. I if know. the shroud is authentic, 
we actually have a photograph of the resurrection. Isn't that cool? Uh -huh. Now, you know, so when the Shroud of the STIRP team, Shroud of Turn Research Project team, uh, uh, scientifically analyzed it in the late 1970s, they walked away having no idea how the image got on there. They went in thinking it was going to be fairly easy to prove it was a forgery. They walked out saying, this doesn't look we to be like a forgery. It. Yeah, can't, we can't do can't, it. Yeah. And then in 1988, they had the carbon-14 testing, mm -hmm. and it, it, they said, I think it was like the, what was it, the, the 14th, 13th, well, they had 14th mixed century. Dating, right, on, yeah, it was all some mixed it. dating. But it was pretty, it was pretty damaging uh -huh. yeah. to it. Um, and then, I think starting around 2003, 2004, they started to, stuff started to come out that really called the C14 testing into question. Right. But there's really, you know, in that book I gave you, just uh, uh, when we saw the, each the, other, the, the Festschrift for Gary Habermas. Oh, yeah, yeah. There are two essays in that On the Shroud of Turin, really good essays, one by Mark Foreman, friend of mine, who's right. a philosopher, and then another by Barry Schwartz, who, Who's not a Christian. Not a Christian. He's an agnostic. He's Jewish. Um, he was the official photographer for the Shroud of Turin Research Project team. So he's actually seen the Shroud. He's been there. He photographed it. Again, he's an agnostic. He tends to think the Shroud is authentic, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, and he, his essay, he demolishes this carbon-14 testing, new stuff. Mm -hmm. It's pretty phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You'll like the essay. Yeah, I will. I, I'm like going to like you, that. You can't even appeal to it because of the way it was flubbed back in 1988 yeah. when they did it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What's the strangest alternative theory to the resurrection you've heard? Uh, probably. Well, I guess there'd be two, really. The one posited by Muslims that, that Jesus, yeah. uh, God made uh, God either substituted right. Jesus mm -hmm. with either Joseph, um, Simon of Cyrene, who carried his cross, or Judas, as the Gospel of Barnabas says. I mean, this is just bizarre and I think easily refuted. The other one is the twin hypothesis mm -hmm. uh, posited by Greg Cavan, who he doesn't even accept anymore. He did his doctoral dissertation on it. He said, look, you know, none of these other alternative explanations work. And so the only thing that's even conceivable here is Jesus had an identical twin and that, and, and Jesus was crucified, he died, but the identical twin came and said, hey, I've risen from the dead. But when I debated him years ago, he said, hey, do not bring that up. I don't want you to bring it up in the debate because I don't take it anymore. So, um, yeah. His views changed it did, yeah. as that can happen. But, uh, well, let's switch gears. Um, just. Let's look at uh, the the controversy over you know in in your big in your big book on the resurrection um, the part in Matthew twenty seven fifty one fifty three which is a very weird little um, couple of verses. Oh, they're going to get you for saying it, calling it weird. I called it strange, it's, and it's they jumped wonky. all over. Yes, it's <laughs> well, you know, there are a lot of strange things in the Bible. I know there are. <laughs> uh, but regarding these miraculous events like the temple veil tearing, the earthquake, the dead bodies rising, and then mm -hmm. walking around after Jesus rose. Um, so, first of all, you know, is there any evidence to believe that these events actually happened in history? Uh, as an historian, what do you think about that? And then, if, if we need to somehow sort it out, what's a reasonable way to sort it out, which you did in your book, and I'm just asking you to kind of, you know, because your only alternative is to say, well, is to go very liberal and say, well, it's just, the whole thing's a myth. Mm -hmm. It's mythical writing here. He's just, he, you know, and you don't, and, and, and you don't say that. So no. what's reasonable? Well, I remember one skeptic saying, when I was doing my research on it, one skeptic uh, called it the clearest example of myth making in the mm -hmm. New Testament, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I wanted to find out what is going on here because there are certain phenomena um, and reported at Jesus' death. And it's reported in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Interestingly, none of them are reported in John, right? Um, but like Matthew, the sun darkening, the, the yeah. sun went dark. Yeah, just quake. as darkness, right. co you know, uh -huh. covered the earth, yeah. and um, and the temple veil split. That's right. that's what's in um, Mark and Luke. Mm -hmm. But Matthew adds four more. Mm -hmm. He talks about there was an earthquake, and the rocks split, and the tombs were opened. And many of the of the saints that were dead uh -huh. rose, and after Jesus rose, they came out, 
and went into the holy city and appeared to many. Yeah. All right. Matthew's the only one that re reports that right. Right, right there. So the question is, you know, why, you know, did this real, really happen? What evidence is there that it happened? Um, well, um, Ignatius in the early part of the second century, and Ignatius seems to have known Polycarp. Um, there's a little, little doubt about that. And Polycarp, you know, there's reason to believe that he knew the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee. So, okay. you know, we're not too far removed from apostolic witness there. And uh, Ignatius was a, the bishop of um, Antioch, I believe it was. And he was on his way to being martyred in Rome. He had, was a prisoner on his way and he wrote letters. I think there were six of them. And in one of those letters, he talks about, um, I forgot what he says, but it appears that he is referring to that. Or it's not crystal clear, but he may be referring to that. So that's one thing. Another thing is, and this doesn't relate to um, uh, the dead saints rising, but you know you have this phenomena that happens. We 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 would call those portents, portents, and they're not unique to what's happening here at the crucifixion of Jesus. Josephus reports some portents that took place just prior to the 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 uh, temple being destroyed in Jerusalem. So we're talking late 60s here, right? Um, and he reports that um, the doors uh, to the temple, which took more than, um, I think it's more than 20 men to open, they opened by themselves, that there was a light uh, that made things brighter than midday. It shone down on the temple around midnight. Um, a cow gave birth to a lamb in the temple quarters. Uh, that there was a sound like, I think, of a rushing wind, and then voices were heard inside the temple saying, we are now leaving this place. And there was a comet involved. So, you know, did he mean this, all of this in a literal sense? Do we really think that a cow gave birth to a lamb at that point? Um, so there's these kinds of things, or was, uh, was, was Josephus using language like Livy and some others used when reporting the assassination of Julius Caesar, that there was an eclipse of the sun and things. Livy reports that Mount Etna erupted, that, that, that um, there was an eclipse of the sun, there was a comet, the stream stopped flowing, black intestines were seen outside of cattle, um, that um, voices were heard in the woods, pale phantoms were seen walking around mm -hmm. at sunset. Mm -hmm. You thought, hmm, sounds like more of the same stuff, you know. It, just a, it's just an emphasis or a way to... I think it's poetic devices mm -hmm. there because Livy is certainly in this, in this scenario, he, when he's reporting this, it's poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you get these portents, you have poetic devices that are commingled with historical elements. And sometimes they're very hard, if not impossible, to untangle. But that brings back, you know, is, what, what are we looking at? Is, is there any evidence that this was historical? Well, Tacitus, in his, um, I believe it's his Annals of Rome, when he talks about around the time the temple was destroyed, that a bright light shone uh, during the night. So is Tacitus getting this from Josephus, or was this something actual that happened? That seems to weigh in favor of these portents being historical. But then you got to deal with the thing about the cow giving birth to a lamb. Well, did that so happen? Did, it disentang that maybe, you, maybe one thing happened, but they were all, you know. Well, there's reason to believe that that ha occurred, mm -hmm. that they did get commingled, and here's why. I have a friend named John Ramsey, recently retired from the University of Illinois in Chicago. He's a classicist and was professor of Greek there as well. And back in the early 2000s, 2007, I think it was, he, he published a catalog of comets in the Greco-Roman literature from, I think, 500 BC through 400 AD. And so you have like 900 years here where he reports every time a comet appears in the ancient Greco-Roman literature. And he also consults the Korean and Chinese literature as well. And what he was able to find, Julie, is that there were occasions where we can actually know that a comet appeared at like the Hale-Bopp comet or Halley's comet. Mm -hmm. It appeared at that time when it's reported. But NASA has a website where you can go to it and type in a year 
and click on a geographical region and, and it will tell you whether there was a, a visible eclipse of the sun in that region mm -hmm. during that year. Right. And by comparing this, you can, we can tell that when they report a comet and an eclipse of the sun as portents, we know that the comet was real, but the eclipse was not. So we know that they did commingle things for effect in the literature. So is some of this happening. So we do find in, you know, not only Livy, but also I think it's Dio, Cassius Dio, um, in the second century that he reports about phantoms walking around um, and things as, as well as Livy. So it's like this stuff is going on. And, and by the way, you also have uh, Dio reporting that I think it was when Caesar went into Egypt, the doors, the gate, the big doors to the temple of Jupiter, which took many men to open, he says, they opened by themselves. Do you see some, there's, there's a lot of parallels here. And I think these are poetic devices. I, that's what I tend to think. Because you do have some problems if you want to accept this as historical. Why is it that none of the other gospel authors reported? I mean, this would be something worth also, reporting, right? Also, wouldn't it right? theologically be a little bit... It's theologically bit, difficult. A little bit difficult if people are being raised from the dead before... Uh, well, Paul says or, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, that Christ is the first yeah. fruits of those mm -hmm. who sleep. In other words, he's to be first to be raised with a resurrection right. body. Others were raised like so Lazarus. So they would have had to die again. Exactly. I mean, yeah. So now you're saying, were they raised in a resurrection body or a mortal body like Lazarus right. was? If they're raised in a resurrection body, now you come in conflict with, with Paul. With a if they're raised in a mortal body, well, now they haven't had anything to eat or drink for at least 36 hours. Uh, they come out, they're hungry. They're th what, what are they doing in the meantime between Jesus' death and when he rose, if you had been there, would you see them pacing back and forth? Are they talking? You know, what kind of clothes do they have on? Um, they're hungry. They're thirsty. They're homeless now. They probably have some really cool stories about their experience in the afterlife, but we really don't even hear these. Yeah. We might just have a hint of them in, in Ignatius, and then we don't hear about them for a while afterward. I just tend to think they're part of the poetic devices, portents, that we, we also see in, at Pentecost, you know, mm -hmm. when they're speaking in tongues and they say, the, the skeptics are saying, you guys are filled with new wine. And Peter says, no, this is what was spoken of by, by Joel the prophet. And what does he say? Young men will have visions. Old men will have dreams. The spirit of the Lord will fall upon you. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. They don't mention about speaking in tongues. But, oh, and the sun will go dark and the stars will fall from the sky. That's in Joel too. Uh -huh. The same passage, okay. Yeah. Peter doesn't mention them, but that's in the past. Well, the sun didn't go, the, the right. stars are still up in the sky. Right. Um, so it's poetic language to talk mm -hmm. about an event of cosmic, even divine significance. And I think that's yeah. what Matthew's doing here. Well, I mean, I know it was hard on you, the, what the controversy called, mm -hmm. uh, ca yeah. ca this caused, uh, because uh, of course people uh, really got their panties in a wad about, <laughs> uh, you know, concluding it this way or being or having this be the reasonable uh, answer. It, it was difficult yeah. on our family. Yeah. It, our kids suffered from it because yeah. it was stressful around the I, house. I, I can't imagine. My wife was really stressed out. Gary Habermas was really stressed out. He yeah. met long term. He, he told me he lost 25 pounds. <gasps> oh, dear. Yeah, as a result, I got thick skin, so it bothered me, but not as much as it did my wife, my kids, or Gary. And I figured, you know, Lord, I, I'm just trying to be honest about this. I could be wrong, but I'm trying to be honest. Right. And this ministry is yours. I serve at your pleasure. And if it's over, it's over. I'm going to just be honest about it and be where my, I think my research has led me. Well, having, you know, some time between, you know, is good because I, I feel like the controversy um, stirred up my interest and I think many others just to really thinking about the what what does it mean for the text to be inerrant mm. and what does it mean when we say it's divinely inspired and these tend to be they they became very loaded terms during this period and you could hardly you know <laughs> you could hardly discuss you know it's hard to even discuss this this with people but we we discuss it a lot in in um, our Russia Christie group too and I really appreciate, I, I want you to kind of talk about the, the, how you come to have 
a, a, the, a proper meaning of those terms or what the text is, right? And it, you, you mentioned there's two approaches, a bottom-up and a top-down. Mm. And I, I think people either have a bottom-up or top-down approach. And um, so kind of explain those and, and why it might be very beneficial to us to have a bottom-up approach. Yeah, you know, I got those terms from my friend Mark Strauss, who's a New Testament scholar out at um, uh, Bethel Seminary in San Diego. Great guy. Um, so most, I'd say most evangelicals who are, iner- who are inerrantists take a top-down approach because, you know, they're used to hearing inerrancy uh, mainly uh, given by people like the late Norman Geisler and others who were philosophers. They weren't really biblical scholars, they're, they're philosophers. And um, so what they do is they come up with a syllogism uh, that's typical. It says, God cannot err, the Bible is God's word, therefore the Bible cannot err, okay? Um, and so that's a top-down approach. So it's like, okay, philosophically, if that syllogism, if the logic is sound and the premises are correct, then the conclusion follows. It's it it it's it's airtight, right? Right. right. Um, and so, therefore, if you see something that appears to be a contradiction or an error, it can't be. There has to be an explanation for it. And if they are right, if they are correct on the syllogism, then that does follow, and they would be correct that there could not be an error in the Bible. The problem is is that um, that syllogism is really flawed. Um, because it assumes, well, let's put it this way, that second premise, the Bible is the word of God, that carries a lot of freight in it that is, goes unstated and not defended. What does it mean to say the Bible is the word of God is the question here, okay? And that would assume that when, when you're saying that the Bible is God's word, that every single word in Scripture is as though he dictated it, all right? But the thing is, nobody thinks God dictated Scripture. You know, no scholars do. Not even Norman Geisler thought it was dictated. Now, he probably had a uh, quasi-dictation view, um, even though he would have denied it. Because if you think that every single word in Scripture is exactly as God wanted it and planned for it to be, well, then you hold somewhat of a quasi-dictation view. Um, so you have to deal with what you, you know, the nature of scripture or what scholars refer to as the phenomena of scripture. And what I found as a, um, a student of the New Testament, that as I look through the gospels, the things that I observe, the phenomena in scripture do not, they're, they're not in a line with, with, you know, a quasi dictation view of scripture. So then you start to say, okay, well, let's, what are they using, you know, to, to say the Bible is the word of God in that quasi-dictation sense? Um, what does it mean to say something is divinely inspired? So they go to 2 Timothy 3.16, right? right? All scriptures God breathed. Well, that almost sounds like dictation, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. God breathed. But they don't think it's dictation. So explain to me the mechanism then. What does it mean to say it's God breathed? Uh, I don't know. Well, okay, how about 2 Peter 1, verses 20, 21? That no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Uh, but men moved by the Holy Spirit or carried along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Okay, what does that look like? What does that look like? Doesn't that sound like quasi-dictation? What does it look like? Mm, don't know. Okay, so Scripture really doesn't tell us what the process or mechanism of divine inspiration looks like. So we're, so back, in that to inf- case, we're back to inferring. Exactly, right? not deduction. You're here from inference. inference. And that is where you take a bottom-up approach and you say, now I'm going to look at Scripture, I'm going to make observations of Scripture, and then from those observations I'm going to formulate um, some possibilities of what it means to say it's divinely inspired or how the process took place. And so you start to see things such as most, the large majority of scholars think that Matthew and Luke used Mark as their primary source and supplemented him. So there are occasions, plenty of occasions, 
where we can compare how Matthew and Luke use Mark and we find that they edit him. So for example, they will take some poor grammar that Mark had and they will improve the grammar. Well then, okay, if they do that, and they do that on a few occasions, so if they do that, are we to think then that the Holy Spirit on some occasion looks back and says, you know what, I can do better than that. Let's say it this way in Matthew. You know, and then we find a couple of occasions of editorial fatigue in Luke. Well, certainly we can't think of the Holy Spirit later saying, how did I miss that? Or what about Paul's memory lapse in 1 Corinthians 1.16 where he says he can't remember whether he baptized anyone outside the household of Stephanus and a few others. Um, certainly the Holy Spirit didn't say, Paul, let's take a writing break while I go check my heavenly records. So we see that there is certainly a human element in Scripture. Um, what do we do with this? If this is the phenomena of Scripture, we've got to form our, our view of Scripture based on what we see. So I tell my students this. Our view of Scripture should be consistent with what we observe in Scripture. And then I say this. When we, when we look at things and we say, eh, I'm a little uncomfortable with what, this, what they do, and sometimes Matthew will change the words of Jesus as reported in Mark, you know. Not really the, the, the sense. Sometimes a little bit, but we see the New Testament authors and Paul doing this with the Old Testament, you know, and this can be troubling to us moderns because we don't do it and we'd fire a pastor who did it, you know, but the, the gospel authors, the New Testament authors did some things that would make us uncomfortable, but scripture is as God intended and God saw that it was good, right? So here's the second principle I give my students. If we truly want to have a high view of Scripture, we must accept it as God has given it to us rather than forcing it to fit a mold of how we think He should have. And if we refuse to do this, we may believe we have a high view of Scripture, but we actually have a high view of our view of Scripture. Right. So I think in terms of how we view inspiration, um, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, Jesus believed that scriptures were divinely inspired, and so I do too. I think the best proposal I've heard to date on how scriptures are divinely inspired was articulated by William Lane Craig in an article titled, Moved by the Hol mm -hmm. Men Moved yeah. by the Holy Spirit Spoke from God. It's, it was published in the inaugural issue of Philosophia Christi, and it's readily accessible on reasonablefaith.org. And uh, in there, he just says, he appeals to middle knowledge. He says, God looked at all the possible worlds, and he said, hey, in this possible world, Paul will write and address these certain things. And so that's the world God actualizes. And so um, Bill says, would God have said things a little bit differently if he were writing it? Yep. Uh, would he have used perhaps some better logic? Yep. But it was acceptable to God. But he, but God used a human element. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and he was glad, and he obviously thought that was good. That's right. Right, because it's not like the Quran that is di dictation. That's right. right. So that it's not, and everyone would say that's not. It is not that. Right. Oh, I don't know. Richard Howe kind of said it was dictation in that Yeah, in that I don't debate. know. He wouldn't say it's dictated, no, no, he, but he, I, he, uh, he'd be hard-pressed to get out of, I think, a quasi-dictation uh, kind yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, well, taking the text as it's given to us, so we can, we can infer that God is not that concerned with immaterial imperfections or mm -hmm. the things that you're talking about. That's kind of how I, 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 you know, I'm... I would say the things are not material that the human, where the human element is, is involved in these, you know, the contradictions and the synoptics and things like that, or how uh, there's some imperfections in the text. So this is a personal question. <laughs> Does this view of God, so we're, we're saying that God is okay. We're saying he's, he is, accept, he accepts that 
Um, this that he's given us has some immaterial imperfections, which we observe in the text. How does that affect how you think of God being interested in small details of our lives? Because, I mean, you know, I grew up thinking, you know, every hair on your head, uh, every little thing he is interested in. We were supposed to pray about everything. You know? yeah. So I wonder, does that, does it flow into, does this view of God and the scripture flow into how we think of God and ourselves? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and, you know, this is something I guess we all wrestle with. How involved is God with us? God certainly knows everything about us, right? He has the right. hair on our heads numbered. He's numbered our days. Um but how much in our lives does he determine? Now, I'm not, um, I, I'm not a determinist. Oh, well, I'm not thank a hardcore Calvinist. <laughs> I'm not a hardcore Calvinist either. Yeah. So, um, so. No, I'm not either. So, uh, so this is know. okay with me. Yeah. This is, this is not. I this, think he allows stuff to happen yeah. to us without uh -huh. determining it's yeah. going to happen yeah. to us. I think he gives us a long leash for our, our free will. My dad used to think that God determined everything mm -hmm. in our lives to happen. But then I'd say to him, well, Dad, that means he determined that we would sin. Mm -hmm. So he is the author of sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, oh, no, no. Well, I said, well how that. do you explain that? Well, you, you can't if, mm -hmm. if you're a hardcore Calvinist. It's kind of hard to get out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's change gears okay. uh, to the gospel differences. You, you've researched the question of the gospel differences, and, and for so many years there was all the harmonization and all the explanations for the uh, gospel differences. But you, can you briefly share what you found by taking them as you know, ancient biography and how that mm. kind of cha changed the way you look at, at um, how they were composed and, and how to deal with that issue? Yeah, I'm so excited. That's such an exciting topic. And you mentioned about Gospels being ancient biography. I mean, that in and of itself is such an interesting topic and sheds great light on certain passages and scriptures that, that weren't really as clear ahead of time, like in Christology. I mean, I saw something. I mean, Mark's Christology is every bit as high as what we find in John, mm -hmm. really. When you see it, view it through the eyes uh, uh, of ancient biography. I could get off on that, you know, and, and talk about get off and talk about that, but I'll forgo that. So what, what I found um, is, all right, if, if you were a, per, a biographer in the first century and you were writing a biography of someone who had lived in the first century, for readers in the first century, would you write according to the literary conventions in play in the first century? or those that would not come into play until more than 1,500 years later? <laughs> the answer is obvious, right? So the, the question is, um, how did the, the literary conventions of ancient biography differ from what we have today, and how do we discover that? Um, so the, the only way you discover it is by studying ancient biography, you know? And some work has been done on this. More has been done in the last probably two decades than and all the time before mm -hmm. then. Yeah. You, but you had people like Charles Talbert and David Awney and some others. And, but then it was Richard Burridge who did the seminal work on this and What Are the Gospels? I think it came out in 1992, and it just had its 25th anniversary edition, I think, two years ago. Uh, it was published through Baylor. A great book. Um, so the Gospels are ancient biographies. So um, I, I made a list of all the biographies that were written about anyone and they were composed within 150 years on each side of Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's no magic number there. It's just you got to limit it somehow. There wasn't hard, maybe none that were composed before that period. Some, you know, after that period, though. Um, so there are about 90 of them, okay? And of those, not, 90 that have survived. And of those, 48 of them were written by a guy named Plutarch. Yeah. The real Plutarch, not the guy in the Hunger Games, no, right? No, I am. So... Um, <laughs> And Plutarch, finest ancient biographer. So I decided, oh, I'm going to start. I'm going to read through those. So I read through the 48 of them. And as I got through the end, I realized that there are a number of them. They mention the same people because they're written about people who lived at the same time, like Cicero, Caesar, Brutus, Antony, you know, people like that. So I was like, okay, I went through and said, 
right, there are nine of them that have characters in them that are overlapping. You know, they're contemporary with one another. So let's go and reread those nine. And let's make a catalog of all the different uh, the stories that appear in two or more of those. So I did. Uh, actually, what I did is I made a, an outline of all the stories in each of them. And then I read it through a third time and updated the outline. And then I looked at all the, the ones that appeared in two or more. And there are 36 stories that appear in two or more of those. And then I went through each of those with a fine tooth comb and found that 30 of the 36 have differences in them. And by the way, as I started reading through of these... Of same events, of, of talking about the same events. Yes, yeah. in two or more of the same. So, and some of them, like I think uh, the Catalinarian Conspiracy appears in seven of the nine. Oh, pretty amazing. So um, b before I embarked on this, I contacted Christopher Pelling, who's the foremost Plutarch scholar in the world. He just uh, retired from Oxford a couple of years ago. And my friend John Ramsey is, was a colleague of his, and so he put me in, in touch with him. So I, I, Pelling was just such a neat guy. I mean, he's just, he just, his knowledge is so vast when it comes to Plutarch. And I said, I told him what I was thinking of doing. And I said, surely, you know, you guys have already done something like this in the classes, classics. And uh, he says, yeah, some work has been done. Um, I said, well, what's the most thorough? He said, well, it's a, an essay that I wrote a paper that I published back, I think, in the 80s. He said, but it was republished and updated in, I think it was 2002 or three, in a book called Plutarch in History, Chapter 4, just one chapter, in which he assessed, I think he took just six of the people and a handful of stories, and he looked at various compositional devices and, and, and compared them and inferred from those certain compositional devices like compression, conflation, displacement, transfer, et cetera. I thought, wow, well, you haven't gone further in this? No, this would be new. So the fact that I did it with 36 stories or 30 stories just surpassed anything anyone else had done with Plutarch at that point in this regard. And then I compared it with the Gospels. So I had read the Gospels, I think it was eight or nine times in Greek, and I made a catalog of all the differences that I found. Um, there was over 50 pages of differences I found. Um, and then I read what are called the compositional textbooks. These were textbooks that children in their teens uh, who were gone on in their education, they already knew how to read and write, but now they were learning how to write well. And they would go through these and they would learn how to write a eulogy or how to compose a history. Um, uh, and they learned all these different techniques, how to do poetry. And in particular of interest for me was how to paraphrase. And so they would do things like... This is young Greek children? This is their textbook? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. And mid-teens and above, usually men, but, but also some females of the elites usually would, would get thrown in there. Um, and um, yeah, so this would be how to write well. And there was a Latin compositional textbook uh, by Quintilian that has survived. So we, and we have one from Theon and Quintilian from the first century. Theon was Greek. And then you have some from like Athonius, Hermogenes, and, and some that come in later centuries. And we know that before Quintilian and Theon, others existed, but we don't, we don't know who wrote them and we don't have any traces of them. But some of them, they're reporting that they are using the same exercises in these. So we know that these have existed for a, a long time. And so they, they teach different ways of paraphrasing. Well, here's what's interesting, Julie. Now I go to the Gospels and I start reading through these differences, how the two or more of the Gospels report the same event. And you can note it. And I read them in view of these compositional devices that Plutarch used, that other ancient biographers used, and that are prescribed in the compositional textbooks. And the compositional textbooks, Theon is clear, that these techniques are used in every form of writing, whether it's, and he mentions poetry, and he mentions history. So we can expect to see these things in historical literature, like the Gospels, because Biography is a subset of, of history. And when you read the differences in view of these compositional techniques, you say, wow, this is what they're doing. 
in many of the cases. Now, there are other explanations. It's like, I don't have to try to harmonize these. There's a better explanation for these things. Now, harmonization can work at times, and maybe there are some cases when harmonization provides the, the best, correct yeah. response, uh -huh. you know? So what I did in my book... But some that are sticky, that just really don't sticky. fit. Really sticky. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's like the genealogies, you try to harmonize them, don't try to harmonize them. They're not meant to be harmonized. Matthew is doing an artistic work here, I can show. Well, what about the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew versus the Sermon on the Plain in Luke? Um, maybe he did the one on the top and then he did it again. On, don't do that. No, that's not what's going on. Matthew changes or the location. Or he cleared the temple twice, at the beginning and the end. Exactly. Or the centurion. Or, yeah. yeah, there's yeah. all these things. These things are easily explained when you look at the kind of compositional techniques that ancient biographers would commonly use. This isn't just unique to the Gospels. Okay, and so this may, this, this is, to me it's very exciting. Oh, I me mean, too. I, 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 I don't find this. And by the way, I'm writing a uh, less technical book on it right now. I've got several publishers interested in it, hoping it'll be out in 2023. But it's going to go through a lot more things and simplify things and give new examples and talk about how this all fits in with divine inspiration and oh, biblical that, inerrancy. That'd be great. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's in the works now. Mm -hmm. okay. It's almost done. So how do you respond to the critics who say, well, man, you're going to talk about all these literary devices they use. Actually, uh, you're saying that biblical authority is compromised. They, you know, they're, they're, they're basically it's an attack on you know, inerrancy or biblical authority. How, 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 do you, how can you respond? That's easy. It's an attack on their view, their particular yeah. understanding of what biblical inerrancy and inspiration is. It's not an attack on inspiration, inerrancy, or authority. It's on their view of it. Remember I said, if we want to have a high view of Scripture, right. we've got to accept mm -hmm. as God gave it to us. We don't want a high view of our view of Scripture. We want a high view of Scripture. Um, and that has to be consistent with what we observe in Scripture. So it attacks their view of Scripture, but it doesn't attack the authority, inspiration, and inerrancy of Scripture in any right. way. Mm -hmm. My friend, that's, that, 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 that's really good. Yeah. I mean, that's really good. And my friend Michael Bird, who is an Australian New Testament scholar, he puts it this way: They talk about the inerrancy of the text, but it's actually the inerrancy of their interpretation. So one of the devices is displacement, where mm. they might put um, the the speech of a character and move move the context or move it to an to another place. Um, does that apply to this problem of the delay of, of the second coming of Christ where we, we get, get all these strange things about these people aren't going to die until Jesus comes back and you go, well, wait, that can't be right. Yeah, that's a tough one. This is one of the toughest things because, you know, Jesus seems to be saying that he's going to return during his lifetime. That's kind of problematic in itself, right? Um, and because he's not supposed to know when he's in return. Well, you know, I... <laughs> I mean, in, in what, right? Yeah, I see three possibilities, three major possibilities. Either one, Jesus got it wrong. Or two, uh, the gospel authors or their sources got it wrong. Or number three, we're, we get it wrong in our understanding, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think Jesus got it wrong. I think it's one of the other two. Because Jesus did say he doesn't know the time that's coming. And but the fact using you, this, this on some of, using this literary, you know acknowledging that this displacement could be taking place in Matthew. Yeah. Um, you could sort, you, I, I mean, I, I haven't spent any time sorting it out. I'm sure other people are. But you could, you, that could be one of the things going on. Is that what you think? Yes. Now, you're married. Mm -hmm. I'm married. Anyone who is married understands that sometimes our spouse says things and we hear them saying something else or we say something and they hear us saying something else. Mm -hmm. And not just married people, I mean, it happens all the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we just misunderstand because we think, we have an idea of what they're saying, but they have a different idea in mind. So we're interpreting what they're saying in view of what we think they're saying. Mm -hmm. They do this in politics all the time, right? Mm -hmm. People get misunderstood. So it could very well be the case that um, what happened is Jesus made a certain statement, okay, and the gospel author 
is thinking that he's referring to something when maybe he was referring to something else. And so they're linking it to a certain thing at a certain time. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, some of the disciples might have just misinterpreted Jesus. So it could be a matter of, of interpreting mm -hmm. the text better and not just that it was somehow those words were put in misplaced or, or in a different context. So uh, It yeah. could be any number of things. Yeah. You know, and it very well could be that we're just mistaken in our understanding. Because, look, you know, there's an otherness, as Peter Crawford would say, there's an otherness to the ancient world. They said things and did things differently that are very foreign to us. And so, like, for example, when Jesus says, tells his disciples, look, you're going to be arrested, you're going to be beaten and scourged and crucified. Um, but... If you endure to the end, not a hair on your head will be harmed. Well, wait a minute. They're going to scourge the skin <laughs> off my back and impale me to a cross. But as long as I, at least they're going to leave my hair alone, right? Well, obviously that's not what it means. But what does it mean? Well, I haven't found anything in the ancient literature, even outside the scriptures, that would shed light on that. You know, things about, you know, plucking your eye out, chopping your hand off if, if it causes you to sin. Seneca the Elder has something very similar to that. Mm -hmm. If your heart is evil, rip it out. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's not meant literally, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Neither is the other stuff. Paul says something similar. He puts it in different terms. He says, consider the members of your earthly bodies as dead to immorality, passion, evil desire, and greed. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. So we, sometimes we find a thing that will help us explain something. I haven't found anything about the hair on our head thing. And it could very well be that when Jesus is talking about some of these things, um, you know, we don't understand exactly what's going on here. Why is it that Matthew and Mark and these guys, they place it by when he's talking about this generation will not pass away mm -hmm. and they will see right. the Son of Man coming in power. Uh -huh. But then um, they put it next to the transfiguration. The transfiguration follows next. Uh -huh. So maybe Jesus was referring to that and he was using language to that and we're saying, yeah, but it doesn't really fit, does it? Maybe not for us today, but maybe it did for them in the way they were talking about things. That's why they talk about the sun will go dark and the stars will fall out of the sky. Usually, they a lot of times they would mention the sun going dark if they were talking about the change of a regime. But we wouldn't use it in that sense today, mm -hmm. you know. I don't so, know. We might. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so maybe you've got some stuff going on with these predictions about the parousia, Jesus returning, but maybe we're not understanding them in the same sense. Mm -hmm. Maybe the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in year 70 is what he was referring to, mm -hmm. and he was using these kind of portents or language in the sense to refer to this that was coming up. Yeah. I mean, when he talks about, or Revelation talks about, he's going to come on a white horse and a sword in his mm -hmm. hand, and, or I'm sorry, his tongue is going to be as a sword and his eyes as fire. Mm -hmm. Do we really think that flames are going to come out of his sockets or he opens his mouth to talk and his sword is going to come out <laughs> off with their head, you know? Right. No, this is figurative language. So the otherness of the past leads me to think that it could very well be the case that we are mistaken. Because if Jesus was mistaken, why would Matthew and Mark include this in there when that, or well, the generation was still been around, but why later on, you know, would they include it? Matthew, we don't know exactly it's written, but yeah. it's probably after right, Mark. Right, right. Why, why would they include it? If they knew it was a false they, prophecy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, now, I know the Old Testament isn't really your gig, but you are a historian. And I know you know about Dr. Craig's recent book and how he classifies, um, he, and he uses the term mytho-history for Genesis 1 through 11. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, you know, what, what do you think about, his conclusion, how, how do you define a genre like that? Um, I mean, a lot of people get freaked out over um, that term, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I can understand. Were you there at the EPS when they grilled him on his book? I was. Yeah, I was too. Yeah. yeah. Um, was there... At, he, he, yep, I was there. Plus, I interviewed him. Oh, you did? Uh, yeah, that's yeah. on my, uh, my uh, YouTube channel. But yeah, he's taken some flack. He's gotten some yeah. negative uh, reviews by... by so he, he uses that term, mytho-history. Yeah. How do you take how do you take that genre that term that genre? Well, like you said, I'm a New Testament guy. I, I, I'm not Old Testament. I'm not trying to you know avoid it. It's no, just, I know, I know. I, you're not. You, that's not your. 
I mean, what's his name was there on the panel. Um, um, no, his name escapes me. You know, he he he. John Collins. Yeah, okay. yeah. He he's kind of a the guy, yeah. probably. Yeah. He um, didn't mind that term. No. No. And and you know what? Here's what's interesting. Now, I, I look. It's not something I've studied. It's not my field. And it really, New Testament really is, you wouldn't think it's a whole lot different than Old Testament, okay? And when I did the Plutarch stuff, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm kind of familiar with that era. Era. This should be easy. It's not. There is a, was a huge learning curve. There's a lot of stuff going on in the Roman Empire and the way they did things. And if not for John Ramsey, I would have made some laugh howlers of mistakes that would have been in that book. But I ran it by... Uh, Ramsey and Pelling and uh, Steve Jones down at, um, at my colleague at HBU, Stephen Jones, and then um, also a friend of mine over in, uh, he teaches in, in Switzerland. Um, all four classicists and they, and they looked at it and, you know, and, and provided it and helped it because it's a big learning curve. It's different. Well, the Old Testament is every bit as different yeah. as it is from the New Testament. And I have a lot of well, I shouldn't say a lot, but a couple of friends who teach, they're Old Testament scholars, and they told me, Mike, we envy you in the New Testament because you have so much more to work with than we do in the Old Testament. Yeah. There's a lot of things we just cannot determine. So, um, so things are very different from Old Testament, from New Testament, even in genres and all that. But I'll, I'll say this, um, J.I. Packer, uh, who died, uh, a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, here is one of the guys who, along with Norman Geisler and R.C. Sproul, composed, crafted the Chicago Statement on, on Biblical Inerrancy. So you cannot accuse Packer of denying inerrancy because he helped write the definition, right? Um, he said, well, he didn't understand. Wait a minute. He wrote the definition. If anyone understood it, he understood it because he wrote the definition. All right. And Packer, years ago, he did a lecture. I've, I've got it. I've got it video, or not video, audio recorded. My wife found it online. And in there, he doesn't call Genesis 1 through 11 mytho history, but he says the story of creation is a quasi liturgical celebration of the fact of creation and is not meant to be understood as describing what we would have seen had we been hovering above the chaos of creation. He said, was there a serpent in the garden? He says, I don't know. He said, Were there, was there really a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and a tree of life in the garden? He says, I don't know. Trees are often used as poetic devices in ancient literature. Um, he said, it, he, and, and he says, Evel, well, he didn't say it in that lecture, but in other books where he endorses it, he, he endorsed some books on theistic evolution, Christians who's, who believe that God created through evolution. I know that some are defining theistic evolution differently today. I, st I still am referring to it in the old way of understanding. God created, but he did so through mm -hmm. evolutionary processes. Packer, I asked him personally, um, and this was just a, a few years ago, and I asked him in the presence of Dan Wallace and... Uh, Greg Bennett, uh, I said, do you, uh, do, you, do you believe, and we didn't share any of this with people while he was still alive, and there's stuff in those conversations we still haven't shared with people, um, because we didn't want, he, he didn't want to be involved in any kind of theological controversies, right. and Paul Copen and I met with him on another occasion and asked him stuff, and we all agreed we just wouldn't share some of the things he said. No, I want you to on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, we might at some point, but... Um, <laughs> We asked him if he believed, if he was a theistic evolutionist since he had um, endorsed some books on theistic evolution. And he said he was agnostic on the matter. He said he did not think that Genesis spoke about evolution or the mode of creation one way or the other. So he said it wasn't a matter of being compatible or incompatible. He, he thought theistic evolution was compatible with the Genesis account because the Genesis account wasn't meant to describe how God created. Um, 
it was more or less, he didn't use the term mytho-history, but it was more or less that. And I asked Bill Craig on that interview, do, do you see your view as being very similar to Packer's? And he said, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the problem um, with it being the Old Testament and, and all the challenges there, um, to be able to put it in the historical context, right, um, is that it is hard to disentangle, just like you said in that one, in those few verses, what 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 could it could have been a real historical event from from the from the um, well even details right, 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 in details you have and, and so that invented that ones with historical ten, ones you know hundredfold then is the problem with doing that you know just sorting that out there so yeah yeah but as you know Dr Craig is no lightweight no. and and he. Um, you know, he really studied this for years. I know. So what really is frustrating is when you have some armchair, per, you know, expert who criticizes Bill, and they haven't even read his book. I know. And they haven't really devoted much time to studying this. They're just set in their ways, and it can't be this way because it's the way I believe. It's the same kind of top stuff. Down yeah, top yeah. down. It is top down, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. That was an interesting panel. Well, um, we really need to close. But one, one thing I wanted to ask was, so are, in, in New Testament, in your world, you're going more with Paul now than the Gospels. Did I hear you for, say that? For one? resurrection? For resurrection? Yeah, I always I mean, have. Yeah, you have done that, right? First Corinthians and everything. And that Paul is really a more, um, you could grant Paul, people would grant Paul a lot easier than um, gospels, even though you know everything about the gospels, but well, not everything. Well, but. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean, you're supposed to, but I mean, but but uh, for us to know that we we should um, we should use Paul early. It's early testimony and oral creeds and everything. Paul may very well be writing earlier than any of the gospels, yeah. possible exception of Mark, but he's probably writing earlier than any of the gospels. Um, we know, and it, it's agreed by just about everyone, that Paul knew the Jerusalem apostles, that right. he run his gospel message past and they approved it, Galatians chapter 2. So he's preaching the same gospel message they're preaching. And the resurrection is the center of his preaching in that way. And so if he's preaching resurrection, so are Jesus' apostles. So you can dispute who wrote John, whether Matthew wrote right. Matthew, or whether any of the gospels are rooted in eyewitness testimony. But... Um, and, and most scholars, uh, gospel scholars, do think that the gospels are rooted in eyewitness testimony. That doesn't mean everything, they, they got, that eyewitnesses were saying everything in there, but they're closely rooted in eyewitness testimony, some more than others. Um, but they don't, you know, it, you're going to have a consensus, a heterogeneous consensus of scholars who say Paul knew the Jerusalem apostles and he was preaching the same gospel message they were preaching. And we get very early stuff. Like you mentioned the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, yeah. 3 through 8. Yeah. That goes way back, yeah. you know. And it comes almost certainly from the Jerusalem leadership. Right, right. So it makes it makes total sense. And mm -hmm. it goes right with your mental, mental facts using that evidence. It's if we, if we used minimal facts, yep. And we could say historical bedrock, it, it's foundation upon which you build a hypothesis. It is, as Paula Fredrickson, a uh, uh, historian of Jesus, uh, and I, uh, not a uh, Christian either, um, she calls it these kind of things, historical bedrock, facts past doubt. Very strong. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for answering our questions and being here. Hey, you've been a great interviewer, so uh, thank you. It's great seeing you again, Julie. Okay.